share my screen. Let's do a quick um, check. Today is October 26th. So we're going to just look over a practice lab. We're not going to actually do a practice lab, but just a quick look at some of the pointer things I have for this lab. Um, and then we're going to do a review. Because in chapter nine, we just talked around with pointers. Oops. Did I hit record? Yeah, I did. Okay. And also, your lab four is due on Wednesday. And you also get your lab five assigned. And we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Um, Lab 5 will be used a lot of functions that we will learn about in Chapter 10, which we'll discuss on Wednesday as well. Go back to Visual Studio. Here is, this is a program that I use, uh, wrote to help solidify some of the meaning of what pointers are and what we discussed. Um, as the same thing with the pointer intro, I tried to put the comments in there, but as you can see, when it gets ran, oops, close this. Yeah, this is what I want to see. Oh, I didn't want to do that. I want to just move it over. I want to intro. There. Oh, hold on, I'm trying to get this major delay. What an intro. Here it is. Did someone say in the chat? Let me see. Quick question, yes, Justin? What's your question? So I know you check the code by compound with Visual Studio, but can I also use the other ID from JetBrains that takes C++? Remember I said you can use any compiler that you would want to use. I'm using Visual Studio because I know everyone has access to it. But as long as you know it makes, it should work if you work Jet, if you use JetBrains, it should also work on Microsoft Visual Studio. I'm just running on that because I know everyone has access to that. And so I'm grading on everyone on the same level platform of how I compile your code. But yes, you can use whatever compile you want. Just make sure it runs. All right. The pointers, remember in pointer, um, in chapter nine, we talked about pointers which is another data type. And the sole purpose of that is to store addresses. So I came up with this program to kind of help solidify a few of the concepts that we discussed in chapter nine. As you can see, the simple value information for an integer that I created is 25. But the address of it where I get by this ampersand is this hexadecimal address. So this pointer that I created, it also has an address. But inside that address, it stores the address of the variable that I assigned to it. So like right here.
and then say with pointer, same thing if you move down with pointers with arrays. Remember we talked about an address, a memory, oh man, it's really a bad lag today. As you can see, the array name by itself, in this case, is a memory address. So here's the memory address right here where I just displayed the array name out. But just with the indirection operator, I'm able to get the first element of the array. Remember, this address with no name was always the starting point of that array. And same thing that you can get that the same information through a pointer itself has its own memory address and inside that memory address it stores the address of the array and you can go through it using the traditional array subscripts showing that it, you can also do array subscripts and the reason why I wanted to put this right here is when you use erase pointer notation and you use addresses, remember it's always one times the size of that data element. So as you can see, as we go one through each one of these pointers, the size of an int is going up by four. So if you add four to this four right here, you get eight. Then from there, you would get a C because remember hexadecimal goes to after nine, it goes A, B, C, and it repeats zero, four. So when you increment it by pointers, you are also you know, incrementing the memory address by the number of times you need to increase it by that size. So if you're only increasing it by one, it's one times the size of that data type. And I just, if you can see these, this is using array script notation, array name plus pointer, and this is using this is giving the memory address. This right here is doing the array script notation and dereferencing, and then this is pointers. So there's multiple ways to go through an array using the array subscript notation, array pointer, or just a simple pointer to the array. And so that's just, and also at the very beginning, I won't go uncomment all this code, but I can put this code out on Blackboard. Oh, let me go up to the very top. Notice how we talked about the last class period that you can pass an argument as a pointer or as a reference variable. Both of these are passed by reference. So each one of these that you call will change, can potentially change the original argument because these are both passed by reference. So this one is using a pointer when you see the asterisk and this is using a reference variable with using the ampersand. When you call them, You, oh, I don't think I have the call up. I took that out. The function definition right here with pass by reference. Remember, we have the ampersand, and when you assign the variable right here, you 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 don't put the ampersand. But with a pointer, you have the direction operator. And then you have to dereference it if you want to reassign it. When you pass it by pointer on this one, instead of using the asterisk, you would put that variable. If I wanted to call this value, this function, ah. Pass in the pointer, and I want to pass in the reference variable. I would 
would need to give it the address. So just be cautious of that. Any other questions that we covered with pointers right now before we go for the review? Most with chapter nine and just to get practice with it. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Let's see how good you are at remembering the review questions. See what I can ask. Let's see if I increase this a little bit. Everyone has a mic? Oh, which one's not working? All right, so I'm assuming everyone's mic is working. So Alexander, number one, what, it, what does the indirection operator do? Hunter, can you help him out? Anyone can help him out? Oh, let me see. Someone listened to you. He references a pointer. Checking input. Okay. That's a little time symbol thing, I forget what it's called. The, the time things, it gives a value of what the pointer points to. Looking at the code below, what will be displayed if you send the expression IPTR to C out? You can answer that one. I displayed it. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead. Who said? I think it was Suzanne said it first. He, I asked. I answered the first question. Uh, John, can you answer the next one? Number two. What would what would be displayed if you send the? Wouldn't it still be seven? It would be seven. Because you can do it multiple like, multiple ways. It can like you can put you can just put PTR and it would say seven also. No. If you uh, put PTR itself, that's the next question. What happens if you send the PTR to C out? John, did you answer that one? What's the what did you get? Well, I, I don't know. I thought they were the same, sorry. No. If it's if I, if the reference operator is IPTR, which takes the address. Right. And give you the value to the reference operator. What is it going to give me? Nothing. Give you the address. It will give you the address. I just the address. Yes. Yeah. Because you got to think if the direction operator takes whatever's in the address and the reference and give you that value. If I do not have the dereference operator, then it would just give me the address. Justin, uh, so far you have learned three. Yeah, question. What? Question. Okay. Um. So for that question, the first, so the variable you create, which is, I mean, the pointer you're creating, IPTR. How come it still functions without the I? Because I know using the, the what's it called, direction pointer. Oh, yeah. This might, this might be a typo because what happens if you send? It's just saying. Are you asking the question, what happens if you send just a pointer to C out? I mean, like, I'm looking at it because it, it doesn't have the I in front of it. I'm right. wondering if that means anything. Well, yeah, I, think it, I think what they're saying is what happens if you just send the send pointer, but I guess they should have put I pointer to it. Okay. The actual variable. 
Justin, uh, John Arnold answered that one. Justin Harper, do you have a mic working? So far, you have learned. What is he saying? He said, yeah, he's plugging it in. Okay. We can come back to him. Just, uh, Michael Gary, answer that question. We'll go in that one for him. What? So far, you have learned three different uses for the uh, multiple, isn't it? Multiply, dereference, and uh, oh, I can't think of the third one. What is this whole chapter about? Uh, just for a pointer. Yeah, yeah. How do you define a pointer? You use it at the top. So you got to write multiplication and direction operator and defining a pointer. Um, that was Michael. Alexander, what mathematical operations are allowed on pointers? Okay. I guess he doesn't have a mic. Punto. Punto. Okay. Susan, I guess next on the list is Susan. What math operators are allowed on pointers? Oh, um, Alexander. Chat. I didn't see. If they text, I don't see unless that thing comes up. Yeah. Addition and subtraction. Yes. Who's on the next one? Assuming that pointer is appointed to an N, what happens when you add four to it? Without dereferencing it? Yes. What by default, what would it do? When you add four, if you assuming the pointer is type int, what happens when you add four to that pointer? I showed it in lab just a moment ago. Oh, I wasn't here at the beginning. Um I don't exactly remember. I know it's going to show. It's going to want to show. Mess with the the reference, the memory address, but I don't remember exactly what it does. Well, think about it. when you go when you add value to a pointer, you're not adding it actually to the value of it. So each time you add a certain number to it, it has to go down. That whatever number you want to go down by times it by this number of a number of bytes that that data type can hold. So for this example, it's int. So what it's going to do is going to say, go down 20 bytes. I'm sorry, 16 bytes. Because if int is type 4, you're going to add, put 4 to it. So it's, like, it's going to say, go down 16 bytes. In the memory location? Yes. Okay. When you go down 1, when I, when I did the lab, went down four bytes. Now if I said go down two, it's going to take whatever number you want, times it by that data type, and then that's going to say that's how many bytes to go down. Okay. You know, why, the, why would you why would you need to do that? Because if you're going like through the array, if I have a pointer to the array, I'm gonna that's what's happened behind the scenes. So when I go using a pointer to an array and say go down like we did the normal subscript with the brackets with one. If I have a pointer to it, it's going to say, I don't know what the memory address is. I just know it's going to go, it needs to go down four bytes, whatever that data type is. It's so what, then, it, then it could access the second uh, yes. variable in that array? Yes. So it goes down to the next one and next one after that. All it knows is to say that when you have this data type and I'm incrementing, that means go down that next data type 
byte. If it's double, it's eight bytes. So I know where the next location is. It's doing that behind the scenes for you. That's why I showed it on lab to show when you increase it, it goes down four bytes each time. So that way you can see how it works with the memory. That was who's saying answer that one. Um, look at the fallen array definition. Int numbers. John, what will the following statement display? Eight. Yes. Justin Harmer, what is the purpose of the new operator? Um, wait, new as in wait, so like um, new and then a data type? Yeah, but what's the whole purpose of using this purpose of the new operator? What does it give us? Is it supposed to allocate more memory, allocate memory as a specific data type? It, yes, it gives you a, new me a memory address where you can start using it. It says, hey, I need the size of this int. Give me new memory. So yes. Michael, what happens when a program, oh, I don't know if you read this, but this is answers. What happens when the program uses the new operator to allocate a block of memory, but the amount of memory requested in memory isn't available? On the old compilers, it, I think it would return to zero, and the new ones kind of give you an exception. Uh, I'd have to look that up, but don't worry about those type of questions. I think that's what it was. The older types will return zero. The new one times will be exceptions. Don't quote me on that. I think that's what it is, but I would have to look up the documentation. What? But answer the next one. Um, what is the purpose of the delete operator? To, to free up memory, dynamic memory. Only if it's used by what? Only if it's used by that array? No. Only if you use the new operator. Okay. There's other ways that you can fr ask for memory. You were using C++, which still can use C um, keyword. Malloc and Calloc is another way of giving up um, more memory. But you use the delete one only when you use the new one to f ask for it. Uh, Alexander. What is, uh, which one? Under what circumstances can you successfully return a pointer from a function? Did he answer? Is he responding with message? Um, Hussan, can you help him out? Under what circumstances can you successfully return a pointer from a function? Do you mean like pointer in and then coming coming it back out? Coming it back the question is, can I ask, when you are in a function and you return a value like an int or a double, whatever you have, under what circumstances can you return the address from a function? I'll call function A, and function A is going to return a memory address. Wouldn't it be if you uh, put it in as a parameter, and then it'll automatically change because of its yes. address? Yes, because if you pass in the art, if you pass an argument to a function, and you pass that, you return that memory address. You're still good because that argument is a lot is still accessible and within scope when that function ends. If you return back a local variable that you define just in that function, you have problems because when that function ends, that memory that variable goes away. What's another?
Can't you just make the, make the function the pointer, like uh, like double pointer, whatever function? If you use, if you use, if you use new in that function, say I need new 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 data type of int, then that is also access correct because you're dynamically allocating memory. The whole point is. Be careful what you return back when the function, like when you return back an address to just a local variable, because that local variable is gone when that function ends. So you return that address from that local variable, you still have access to that memory address, but who knows what that memory address is using now because that variable went bye-bye. Remember the scope of a variable is only in those brackets where it was defined. So the only best way is that you can return an address from a function if you pass the argument in or you're dynamically allocating memory. Does that make sense? That you do not want to return back an address of a local variable when that function ends because that variable is no longer in memory. But you still have access to that memory spot, but it might, that memory spot might be used by something else now. Wait. So the new, so the new assigns memory. It, it adds acts out. like a static address. I mean, like a static variable where it stays even though the function is completed. Yeah. No, even though the variable, even though the function's already ended, yes, it's still dynamically allocated. So it's fine because we're asking for a new space in memory, which is fine. Just don't do it for a local variable that's going to go away when that function ends. Okay. So you'd have to delete it? Um, for that ends? local variable, you're writing to addresses that was purposely used for a variable that's no longer there. But for new, since you still do it dynamically, it still allocates it, and you can still also delete it, too. Okay. Um, And John, what is the difference between a pointer to a constant and a constant pointer? Isn't the uh, pointer to a constant, is that, isn't that where you uh, store the address? Well, pointers okay, when you want to. Sorry. Always store an address. That's all the purpose of it. They store an address. So what is the difference between a pointer to a constant and a constant pointer? Yeah, the constant one can. Uh, Point at one thing and can't point at anything else, isn't that right? Well, well, like what you're assigning it to? Which one are you saying? Pointer to constant or constant? Oh, the constant pointer. Constant pointer. Does it repeat what you just said? I said it can it isn't it the one where it's, it can only point at the thing you you know you assign it to. It can't point at anything else. Yes, the constant pointer is once you assign it to point to something, it cannot point to anything else. However, can what it points to change? Yes. Yes, a constant pointer, the address that you initialize that pointer, but what it points to, the value, can change. Now, what is a pointer to a constant? Um, Think of it in reverse. I guess you can use the pointer to, you know, it can point at multiple things. Is that the, right? The pointer can change addresses. Oh, okay. The pointer can change addresses. But what it points to is a constant which cannot change. It's reversed. Yes. I, I got you. Mr. Harmer, what is the advantage of pointer parameter as a constant pointer? <laughs> Uh, the advantages of declaring a pointer, what pointer parameter as a constant pointer? Is that what it said? Yes. Uh, I believe because uh, what's it called? I believe because you can save um, you can save what the pointer of of it was um, 
you can save it because it's constant, then it's not, then it's guaranteed not going to change if it's a constant pointer. Yeah, it's not going to change. And the advantages is that you can keep the um, uh, the you keep the address, and um, you won't have to worry about changing it. Yes. So let's all right. Let's go quickly over the true false and see if there's anything else. You just text it in the chat. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's go back. Yeah. Each byte assigned a unique address. True. The multiplication operator is used to get the address of a variable. False. That's the ampersand. 33. Um, the pointer variables are designed to hold addresses. True. Four. The ampersand symbol is called the indirection operator. False. Um, 35. The ampersand operator dereferences a pointer. False. 36. Uh, when the indirection operator is used with a pointer variable, you are actually working with the value the pointer is pointing to. True. Arrays, arrays names cannot be dereferenced with the indirection operator. False, they can. When you add a value to a pointer, you are actually adding the number times the size of the data type reference for the pointer. True. 39. The address operator is not needed to assign an address to a pointer. True, it's not needed. You can change your address that an array name points to. False, you cannot change it because remember I kept on shouting out the array name by itself with no square bracket is a constant memory address of the starting point of the array. So I said the word constant, so you can't change it. 40, you can change, oh, that was 40. 41, any mathematical operations, including multiplication division, may be performed on pointers. False. Pointers may be compared using the single relationship rela relational operators. Pointer, for, 42, pointers may be compared using the relationship operators. True or false? True. You can use relationship operators on pointers. When you use functional parameters, reference variables are much easier to work with than pointers. True or false? False. When using, wait, hold on. True. Reference variables are easier. Sorry, I misread that the second time. Reference variables are easy to work with than pointers. The new operator dynamically allocates memory. True. A pointer variable that has not been initialized is called a null pointer. What if I have a variable that is not initialized called no? That's false. You have to put it in all pointer. Remember, we have the keyword in all pointer that gives it the address zero. You just initialize, create a pointer. It's not initialized, so it can't be a null pointer. 46, the address zero is generally considered unusable. 
True or false? The address zero is considered unusable, which is true. That's what you assign when you assign a null pointer to it. It puts it the address of zero. In using pointers with the lead operator, it is not necessary for the pointer to have been previously used with the new operator. Well, any questions over pointers? Doesn't harm. You can speak up. You can. What's the question? Um. So, does the null pointer keyword um what header file did that need? I think it's std lib. I want to say. Um. Chapter nine. I could be wrong. I don't remember. Let's quickly go over this so I can see what, if I missed anything. No, it's not that. Array between that, we cover that quite a bit. Arithmetic addition, subtraction, initialize. Missing. Know that there's no balance checking. Know the difference between constant int. Let's see if I find it. No pointer. N U L L P R A N T R. No, I guess you don't need to have a um, preprocessor. Like right here, it's using right here. We just have um, IO stream and IO manip. So there's no header file for it. I know with returning success and so forth, success, failure, and success, the other one is you need the SCDLIB, but you don't, I guess you don't need a header file for no pointer. Any other questions? Let's just reiterate um, what's upcoming. Um, Wednesday is your lab four is due. It's gonna take me about a week to grade that because I have things going on at work. I'll try to grade that as soon as I can. Um, we also assign you lab five, which will use heavily chap um, chapter 10, which is to call, learn about more about the kinds of function is alpha, is numeric, all these, um, Predefined function calls for you. So I'll give you practice with that. And we only have a handful of chapters left. We have chapter 10, 11, and 8. We only have three chapters left in the course. Any other questions or concerns? Oh, yeah. How come we skipped chapter 8? We, we skipped it because I wanted to cover um, pointers right away. Because we we just talked heavily with the rays, and I wanted to get up the next confusing chapter with you was chapter nine. Eight in the real world is useless because it talks about two um, sorting and searching an array, which we already talked about one of them. We talked about the linear sort because you already have it in the lecture slides. Binary search, bubble sort, and selection sort. So it. Just talks about four four different algorithms, and in the real world, we don't use any of them because they're slow. But we will discuss them because they're good for academic purposes. But I will quickly go over them, give you what I'm looking for, what each pros and cons of each one, and give you how it works. In the classroom, it's a lot easier to do because 
I have students lined up in the um, classroom with cards with numbers on them, and we go through, and I have students move around as the algorithm goes so they can actually see how it works instead of just looking at it in the PowerPoint slides. I, the students actually move around, and that helps them solidify the algorithm. But since we're virtual, we'll just quickly go over the lecture slides. But we are going to go back to it after chapter eight because I wanted to make sure you really understand um, pointers because that gets big. And then in chapter 11, structures because you're going to need structures for your lab six that you're going to create. So that is why we bypass chapter eight and we're going to go back to it. Any other questions? I hope that didn't bother you that we skipped chapter eight. Being the reality world, it's we do not use like bubble sort because if you wrote a bubble sort or sorting algorithm, I'm sure the tech lean so forth is going to come back and tell you to redo it. Or selection sort the what they have. Um, there's other ways of doing it. Any other questions, concern? 